chapter eleven of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording chapter eleven miss brotherton pushes her inquiries further a well-arranged scheme disagreeably defeated a visit and its consequences mary brotherton certainly did not return home that night with any doubts on her mind respecting the nature of sir matthew dowling's benevolence but the fever of spirits which had seized her was greatly increased by the information she had gained there was a vast deal of energy and strength of purpose in the mind of mary brotherton but hitherto all this had lain latent and inert the sentiment which in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred is the first to awaken the female heart to strong emotion seemed to be totally powerless to her she had never yet felt the slightest approach to the passion of love nor was it very likely she should for one among her many peculiarities of character was the persuasion that every man who paid her attention was in pursuit of her fortune an idea which to such a temper as hers was calculated to act as a sevenfold shield against all amatory attacks upon her heart most truly therefore up to this time had she continued in maiden meditation fancy free but this could be said no longer neither fancy nor any other faculty could be termed free in one whose thoughts fixed themselves by night and day upon one single subject while feeling that to it she was ready to sacrifice everything else in life on re-entering her house on the memorable night of the dowling lodge theatricals miss brotherton retired to her apartment without even the intention of sleeping she laid her head upon her pillow deliberately determined not to close her eyes in sleep till she had made up her mind as to the best way of rescuing the pale trembling child whose voice and form haunted her from the horrible bondage of sir matthew dowling's charity the question was not altogether an easy one she could hardly doubt that very strong indignation would follow any open effort on her part to interfere with a child publicly held up as the favoured object of sir matthew's loudly vaunted benevolence and moreover privately marked out by his vindictive nature as a victim to his hatred whether as a rival in his munificence or a champion against his hate it was pretty certain that her interference would render her obnoxious to her pompous neighbour's displeasure and this she had no inclination to encounter if she could help it for though at this moment she felt within her a strength and firmness of purpose not easily shaken the poor girl knew that she stood alone in the world with no friend to support her more powerful than nurse tremlett and nothing but her two hundred thousand pounds worth of this world's trumpery to enable her to have her way and her will in many matters that she feared might turn out rather difficult to manage so she determined to avoid quarrelling with sir matthew dowling as long as she could and though the image of michael struggling with his tears and the plaintive sound of his voice as he pleaded for leave to labour again absolutely haunted her memory she determined upon being cautious wise and very deliberative in any measure she might eventually take to ensure his release under the influence of these prudential resolutions miss brotherton for the present abandoned her purpose of seeking a conversation with the child himself and determined to find her way to the cottage of his mother instead yet even this she felt must be done with caution her carriage and her liveries were about as splendid and conspicuous as carriage and liveries could be and though she knew not precisely in what direction the widow armstrong might be found it was easy enough to guess that did she make use of her ordinary mode of conveyance in reaching her abode let it be where it might she would attract more attention than she desired it was to mrs tremlett that she determined to apply in this dilemma and at their tete-a-tete -tete breakfast in the following morning she once more led the conversation to the factories you must not scold me dear friend said she if you find that i have as i told you i would disobeyed your advice altogether about thinking no more of the factory people for i cannot get them out of my head nurse tremlett i am sorry for it my dear replied the good woman gravely because i am quite sure that you will only vex yourself and do no good you ought to know me better by this time mrs tremlett than to fancy that your manner of speaking on this dark subject is the way to check my curiosity it was pretty effectually awakened perhaps before but had it been otherwise what you say would be quite enough to set me upon inquiring into it nurse tremlett i will know everything that the most persevering inquiry can teach me respecting the people to whose labours all the rich people in this neighbourhood owe their wealth and myself among the rest and when i tell you that at the present moment this is the only subject upon which i feel any real interest i think you are too wise to attempt turning me from it by saying my dear you will only vex yourself 
i do indeed my child know you too well to fancy that if you have set your mind upon it you will give it up so i have nothing more to say miss mary well then my dear woman replied mary taking her hand if through all the years we have passed together i have shown such a determined spirit for no reason in the world but only to get my own wanton silly will do me the justice to anticipate that i shall not be less obstinate in this one thing that i believe to be right than in all the many wherein it was most likely i suspected myself to be wrong i do believe nurse tremlett that it is my duty to understand this matter better than i do and if this be so i will trust to god to make up to me for all the vexation your prophecy threatens it will bring if that is the way you think of it my dear child heaven forbid that i should seek to hinder you but rich as you are dear mary if you was to give it all and ten thousand times as much besides what good could it do the mills will go on just the same you know i don't want to stop the mills nurse tremlett why should i industry ingenuity science enterprise must of course be all brought into action by this flourishing cotton trade and beyond all doubt it would be equally wicked and wild to wish its destruction that is not the notion i have got hold of good nurse very very far from it i assure you what i want to find out is whether by the nature of things it is impossible to manufacture worsted and cotton wool into articles useful to man without rendering those employed upon it unfit to associate with the rest of their fellow-creatures this seems to me so gross an absurdity that i cannot give faith to it and therefore i suspect that the depravity and wickedness you and miss martha dowling talk about must arise from these people having too much money at their command this perhaps may lead to intemperance and extravagance don't you think this may be the case mrs tremlett good gracious no miss mary why they are all the very poorest starving wretches upon earth but they may be poor because they are extravagant nurse they must get a most monstrous quantity of money for though none of the gentlemen ever talk much of their factories i have repeatedly heard allusion made to the enormous sums paid every week to the workpeople and it is quite clear that all the families must get a great deal because all the little children work which can hardly be the case elsewhere now i cannot help thinking nurse that a great deal of good might be done by teaching them a little economy and inducing them to lay by their superfluous money in a savings bank that is one great reason why i want to get acquainted with the people themselves now for instance that poor sick widow armstrong the mother of the little boy that sir matthew dowling has taken i am quite sure that she can have no wickedness to hurt me and i am determined nurse to go and call upon her well my dear that can't do no great harm certainly and if you like it i can go in the carriage with you most certainly i should like you to go with me but not in the carriage mrs tremlett i don't want to have all the people in her neighbourhood staring at me or at her either and that they would be sure to do if we went in the carriage i mean to walk nurse do you know where the woman lives my dear no i must leave you to find that out what is her name miss mary armstrong she is a widow and lives somewhere in ashley let us walk into the garden and while i am looking after my seedlings you can inquire of one of the under gardeners or the boy and if you manage the matter well the next prime blossom that i get from my experiment bed shall be called the tremlett geranium while this conversation was going on at milford park the residence of miss brotherton dr crockley arrived to enjoy a tete-a-tete -tete breakfast with sir matthew in the study at dowling lodge this room though not so splendid as some of its neighbours under the same roof could nevertheless be made very snug and comfortable upon occasion and an excellent breakfast was spread before them while the two gentlemen sat in judgment upon little michael's contumacy and consulted on the best method of bringing him into better order confound the imp exclaimed sir matthew as he selected his favourite dainties is it not provoking crockley that i should have taken such an aversion to him upon my soul i never hated anything so much in my life in the first place it is disgusting to see him dressed up walking about the house like a tame monkey when i know that his long fingers might be piercing thousands of threads for two shillings a week and it is neither more nor less than loathsome to see him eat at luncheon sometimes when we have him in before company exactly the very same things that my children eat themselves 
and then upon the back of it all to know that the ungrateful little viper hates the very sight of me i don't believe crockley that any good can come of all this equal to what it makes me suffer in the doing it is perfectly unnatural to see him close within an inch of my own legs i'd rather have a tame toad crawling about by half i must give it up crockley i must upon my soul you are the master sir matthew i can't stop you if do it you will but i can tell you this i have been calling at fifty different houses at the very least since this job began and i pledged you my sacred honour that in every one of them the only thing talked of was your benevolence and generosity such an example cried one so heavenly minded said another it is enough to bring a blessing upon the whole country whined a third and it is to be hoped that such goodness will be rewarded in this world and the next observed a fourth think sir matthew how all this will tell against the grumblings about miss nance stevens and her sudden demise that's true devilish true crockley and yet it's no cure for my being sick at the stomach every time i see him i don't know about that i should think it was or at any rate if you'll only bear it a little longer i should not be at all surprised if you were to be relieved by some other great capitalist setting up in the same way and as your name has been sung out that would do just as well upon my soul i'm in earnest i should not the least wonder if before the end of three months every one of your first rates were to have a tame factory child in their houses to act like the hedgehogs we get to eat black beetles for us and they do their work well too sir matthew all the nasty creeping multiplying plagues in the shape of evil tales against the factory system would be swallowed up by the clearing off effects of these nice little hedgehog gentry you are as keen as your own lancet crockley and i never turn a deaf ear to anything you say but it's monstrous hard though that i can't walk about my own house without running the risk of seeing this odious little grub by the way crockley why could not my lady take a factory girl in by way of charity some of the little wenches are sightly enough before they have worked down their flesh too far and though i can't say i am particularly tender over the lanky idiot looking slatterns that we mostly get at the mill i'll bet what you please that i should never hate the sight of a girl as i do the sight of this boy very likely not sir matthew replied the doctor laughing immoderately but what would my lady say and what would all the other ladies say no no leave that alone and make up your mind to let the boy have the run of the house for a month or two after which you may send him to the devil if you will for the good will be done and the boy himself forgotten that's all vastly easy for you to lay down chapter and verse wise man that you are replied the knight but if i tell all i can let you into a secret crockley that would make you change your mind perhaps the long and short of it is that i can't keep my hands off him and if the young black-hearted scamp i know he is black-hearted i'm quite sure of it on account of a look he has got with his eyes that makes one always feel so uncomfortable if he were to take it into his vile ungrateful head to go about the country telling everything that i may have happened to say and do to him when his nasty ways have pushed me further than i could bear i don't think the history of the charity job would do much good doctor dr crockley gave a long low whistle and then after a minute's meditation said that's a bore i know it is sharply responded his patron a devilish bore but you don't suppose that i am to stand bursting with rage and not take the liberty of speaking my mind to a factory grub do you heaven forbid a whole factory full of wenches may all drop down dead i hope before it comes to that replied his friend but what you have stated is worth attention sir matthew i don't like the notion of that child's having tales to tell it spoils all i know it returned the vexed knight martha told me just now not ten minutes before you came that miss brotherton said she should like very much to talk to the boy she is as sharp as a needle you know and i'll answer for it would find out all he has got to tell and a devilish deal more perhaps in no time pretty work that would make would it not augustus is sure of her he tells me and just fancy such a match as that spoiled by the forked tongue of this little viper the very notion makes one mad a cure must be found for that mischief let it cost what it may replied crockley 
and for the future it might be better perhaps for your charity sir matthew to show itself some other way you are too honest-hearted that's the fact a fine bold intellect like yours can't descend to the paltry patience belonging to inferior minds is there no getting rid of the boy no possibility of sending him prentice somewhere or other prentice said sir matthew looking with a very singular expression into the face of his friend prentice he repeated and stretching out his hand he seized upon that of dr crockley which he shook with extraordinary ardour send him as a prentice upon my soul crockley if you have laid down five hundred pounds upon the table i should not have considered it as of one half as much worth as that one word prentice yes by jove he shall be apprentice oaf that i was for not thinking of it before you don't know half the good you have done me by that word tis but lately my dear fellow that you and i have come to understand one another thoroughly and i have never yet talked to you about one or two points particularly interesting to all our capitalists i never mentioned to you did i the deep valley mills not far from appledown cross in derbyshire never sir matthew as far as i can recollect was the reply well then i will tell you something about them now that will make you perceive plainly enough what a capital good hit you have made in talking of apprenticeship for my young darling deep valley mill crockley is the property of my excellent friend elgood sharpton he is one of the men born to the making of this country a fine manly doubtless character who would scorn to give up his notions before any act of parliament that ever was made his idea is crockley and i should like to see the man who would venture to tell me that it was not a glorious one his idea is that if we could get rid of our cursed corn laws the whole of british dominions would soon be turned into one noble collection of workshops i wish you could hear him talk upon my soul it's the finest thing i know he says that if his system is carried out into full action as i trust it will be one of these days all the grass left in england will be the parks and paddocks of the capitalists sharpton will prove to you as clearly as that two and two make four that the best thing for the country would be to scour it from end to end of those confounded idle drones the landed gentry they must go sooner or later he says if the corn laws are done away with then down goes the price of bread and down goes the operative's wages and what will stop us then doctor don't you see isn't it plain as the nose on your face that when the agricultural interest is fairly drummed out of the field the day's our own who shall we have then spying after us to find out how many hours a day we choose to make our hands work do you see crockley if we choose to work the vitals out of them who shall say we shan't i never heard a finer clearer line of argument in my life sir matthew replied the attentive listener that man that elgood sharpton seems born for a legislator but i question not that when you two get together you act like flint and steel upon one another is not that the case pretty much i believe replied sir matthew and i promise you crockley i give no bad proof of my confidence in your honour and friendship by letting you into a few of our notions for matters are by no means quite ripe for us to speak out as yet our policy is you must know to give out that it is the operatives who are clamouring for the repeal of the corn laws whereas many among them saucy rogues are as deep as their betters and know perfectly well and be hanged to em that our only reason for trying to make down with the corn laws the popular cry is that we may whisper in their ears down with the wages afterwards ay doctor if we can but manage this england will become the paradise of manufactures the great workshop of the world when strangers climb our chalk cliffs to get a peep at us they shall see land at what point they will the glowing fires that keep our engines going illuminating the land from one extremity of the island to the other then think how we shall suck in that is we the capitalists my man think how we shall suck in gold 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 from all sides the idea is perfectly magnificent the fat flemings must give up all hopes of ever getting their financial flax to vie with our cotton again crockley but here sir matthew paused for a moment as if half doubtful whether he should go on 
the confidential impulse within him however worked so strongly in favour of the friendly smiling physician that all reserve gave way and winking his eye at him with a truly comic expression he proceeded crockley they don't understand spinning in flanders they don't know yet how many baby sinews must be dragged and drawn out to mix as it were with the thread before the work can be made to answer no no we have fairly given master fleming the go-by in his own trade so for the future he must just be pleased to go on hand digging and sowing every inch of his dung muxen till it teems with corn for exportation that's what he's fit for whereas science has put us rather in advance of all that my good doctor our friends in poland too shall plough away to the same tune and russia from end to end will become one huge granary at our service where will your aristocratic landholders be then crockley perhaps you can't tell but i suspect i can they'll just be in the factories sir your manners and your preserves we can get game enough from abroad your manners and your preserves will be covered with factories except just here and there you know where we capitalists may have taken a fancy to my lord this thing's grounds or the duke of t'other thing's mansion for our own residences and this i maintain is just as it should be and the reason why is plain we have got before all the world in machinery and so all the world must be content to walk behind us by jove if i had my way crockley i'd turn france and the rhine into a wine cellar russia into a corn bin and america glorious america north south east and west into a cotton plantation then should we not flourish then should we not bring down the rascals to work at our own prices and be thankful too what's to stop us trust me there is not a finer humbug going than just making the country believe that the operatives are rampant for the repeal of the corn laws it is a treat to hear you sir matthew i should be at a loss to name any man that i thought your equal in the gift of eloquence but nevertheless we must not forget business we must not forget master michael armstrong sir matthew no no my good friend we will not forget him be patient for a moment and i will make you understand how my friend elgood sharpton and my darling protege have been mixed up in my mind together sharpton's factory at deep valley is one of the most perfect institutions i take it that the ingenuity of man ever produced it is perfect sir just perfect in the first place it is built in a wild desolate spot where the chances are about ten thousand to one against any of the travelling torments who take upon themselves to meddle and make about what does not concern them it is a hundred thousand to one against their ever catching sight of it you never saw such a place in your life crockley tis such a hole that i don't believe the sunshine was ever known to get to the bottom of it it was made on purpose you may depend upon it well sir sharpton who whatever he undertakes is sure to get over the ground faster than any other man for he never lets anything stop him sharpton felt quite convinced you see that the only way to carry on the work to any good purpose was to undersell and how was this to be done without loss instead of gain that's a question i promise you that has puzzled many a man that was no fool but egad it did not puzzle him he knew well enough that it was not the material that came cheap enough nor yet the machinery though heaven knows that's dear enough but tis the labour sir the damnation wages going on 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 for evermore that drains the money away and what then does he do but hit at once upon the very perfectest scheme that ever entered a man's head to lessen that ruinous burden he knew well enough for he has a most unaccountable deal of general information that there were lots of parishes in england that didn't know what on earth to do with their pauper brats there's many you know that say this one thing this nasty filthy excess of pauper population is the very mischief that is eating up the country and destroying our prosperity but who's the greatest political economist crockley the man who talks of the evil or he who sets about finding a remedy the political economists of the nineteenth century ought to erect a statue to l good sharpton and so they will i have no doubt when the subject comes to be more perfectly understood for just mark what he has done first he finds out this capital spot for the job and builds a factory there 
next he either goes himself or sends agents good capable understanding men to all the parishes that he finds are overburdened with poor then sir he enters philosophically into the subject with the parish authorities but of course with proper discretion and proves to them that in no way could they do their duty by the parish children particularly the orphans or those whose parents don't trouble them so well as by apprenticing them to a good trade here sir matthew paused and a merry glance was exchanged between him and his companion well crockley it is a good trade you know a devilish good trade isn't it at any rate i promise you that so many parishes felt convinced of it that l good sharpton has soon got deep valley factory as full of young hands as it could cram now it is since that you must know that old sir robert took it into his head that little children must not be overworked he it was i believe that first set up that nonsensical cry to any purpose and to be sure nothing ever was so absurd in a country where everybody knows that if the young pauper spawn could be made to die off everything would go on well it is not strange now that old peel could not be contented to grow rich and hold his tongue but no he got bit by some poisonous humanity notion or other and a devilish shake he gave to the system just at first by his absurd bill for the protection of infant paupers but such men as sharpton are not to be knocked down like ninepins either by lawmakers or law and to say the truth old sir robert peel's bill was to all intents and purposes a dead letter within two years after it was passed bless your soul it was the easiest thing in the world to keep the creatures so ignorant about the bill after the first talk was over that they might have been made to believe anything and to submit to anything in fact the question for them always lies in an eggshell they must either do what the masters would have them or starve that fact is worth all the bills that ever were passed and another thing is that as long as there is nothing to prevent our own friends and relations from being among the magistrates even if complaints are made we can manage them how true it is sir matthew that there is no inequality of accidental condition than can equal the inequality produced by a decided superiority in the intellectual powers said dr crockley at this moment i give you my sacred honour that i look upon you and your friend mr elgood sharpton also as standing in a much more commanding position than any duke in the country what's a long descent compared to a long head sir matthew i'll tell you what the difference is a long descent pretty generally helps a man to empty his purse whereas a long head will never fail to help him fill it it is as clear to me as that the sun's in heaven sir matthew that the game is in your own hands i know for i have made some curious experiments that way i know what a dog may be taught to do by hunger and you may rely upon it that it is just as powerful in a man egad sir matthew it is a very fine subject for scientific experiments it is difficult to say how far it might go if a dog for example may be taught tricks by hunger that approach in ingenuity to the powers of man why may not man skilfully acted upon by the same principle be brought to rival the docility of a dog i see nothing in nature to stop it doctor replied sir matthew with an air of great animation but remember my dear crockley this is not a point to be touched upon in the book we were talking of the public you know can have nothing on earth to do with the private regulation of our affairs people have just as much right to inquire at what o'clock my lord duke expects his valet to get up and moreover what the valet eats for breakfast when he is up as they have to know what hours our hired labourers keep and what they feed upon it is a gross inquisitorial interference crockley and ought not to be thought of in a free country that's a first-rate idea though sir matthew said the doctor taking out his pocket-book and pencil i must book that it is turning the parliament into an office of the inquisition the canters may call it a holy office if they will but the british people will never bear the notion of an inquisition that's a capital idea i promise you as to my parallel you know between a dog and a man it is merely between ourselves or such an out-and-out -out friend as mr sharpton and it may be worth thinking about perhaps practically and scientifically i mean but certainly i should never dream of printing it a hundred years hence human intelligence may have reached such a point of improvement that the plain good sense and practical utility of the idea may make it properly appreciated 
but as yet we are not sufficiently advanced in the science emphatically denominated the positive in contradistinction to the ideal it will come though if we do but go on in the path we are in but we are generalizing too much sir matthew nevertheless i suspect i have caught your idea you have thoughts of sending your young favourite to deep valley mill by way of putting the finishing stroke to your benevolent projects in his favour exactly so my dear friend but we must have indentures observe and there is some little difficulty in that i suppose you know best sir matthew else i should say that indentures cannot be necessary from your description the locality of this factory with its romantic name must be like the valley of rasselas at least in one particular namely that without wings the happy dwellers there would find it impossible to escape replied the doctor difficult exceedingly difficult certainly but not quite impossible for without indentures a runaway could not be legally pursued and to tell you the truth friend Carkley, i should not much approve giving a subject for a second part of mr osmond norval's drama in which the hero should appear upon the scene after a few months residence in deep valley mills that's true but i don't see under what pretence you are to get the brad apprentice to your friend sharpton remarked the cautious counsellor if he is apprenticed to me it will do just as well replied the knight for i could make over the indentures to sharpton easy enough but it strikes me i might have some difficulty in making the mother consent to it not if you will be upon your p's and q's sir knight said his friend you have nothing to do but go on sending tidbits to the sick woman and the rickety boy that you mentioned and when they have got a little used to it she'll not choose to affront her generous benefactor remember the dog theory sir matthew they are all alike i dare say you are right but at any rate i had better keep out of that hateful brat's way or rather take care that he keeps out of mine but i shall bear the sight of him better if i make up my mind to send him to deep valley that will wipe out old scores between us having said this sir matthew rose from the breakfast-table seeming thereby to indicate that the consultation was at an end dr crockley rose too but though he took up his hat and his riding-whip from the chair on which he had placed them he lingered as if he had still something to say before he took his leave sir matthew however seemed to take no notice of the hint but stretching out his hand said decisively good morning doctor good morning let us see you again soon dr crockley upon this stretched out his hand too but instead of clutching that of the knight he seized upon his button one word sir matthew one word you are too much of a man of business to think me troublesome respecting that little appointment that you were talking about the other day i should like to have it settled because to say the truth i shall consider myself as wearing your livery or to speak more fitly to be fighting positively under your colours when this is done and of course you know we ought to understand one another completely no doubt of it crockley i said nothing that i do not mean to stand to you shall have two hundred a year paid quarterly for attending to the health and well-being and all that you know of the factory children but as i don't want you to give them two hundred pounds worth of physic remember i shall expect that you will make up the deficiency in in just saying round about the neighbourhood how remarkably well everything goes on at brookford factory i'll pledge you my word that everything does go on capitally well there crockley so you will have nothing on your conscience on that score i am not afraid of that sir matthew i know i may trust you but i should like a bit of memorandum about my own business if you please quite right quite right sir i am too much a man of business to object to that draw up the engagement just as you wish it to be and i dare say i shall make no objection to signing it after this a cordial handshaking was exchanged and the friends parted End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording chapter twelve an unfortunate rencontre an adventure miss brotherton grows wiser every day mrs tremlett's inquiries proved successful jim sykes the weeding boy knew perfectly well where widow armstrong lived and after he had repeated his instructions three times mary brotherton and her unresisting chaperon set off on their expedition 
on one point only did the self-willed heiress yield to the judgment of her companion mary who knew that though she seldom went beyond the shelter of her own park paling she often walked without fatigue within it for two or three hours together wished to set off for hoxley lane on foot but mrs tremlett talked so much of the fatigue that the good-natured girl consented to let the carriage convey them to the point at which the lane diverged from the high road this yielding however was wholly from consideration for her companion for herself she believed the precaution quite needless and she was right however much her temper might have been endangered by the series of spoiling processes she had undergone her health had been taken good care of and few girls of her age in any rank had greater power and will for exertion than herself nevertheless before she had driven half a mile she heartily rejoiced at having sacrificed her own inclination to that of her good nurse for the road to ashley was the favourite ride of the officers quartered in the neighbourhood and had she been seen on foot it is probable that before reaching hoxley lane she would have been surrounded by a bodyguard of military so greatly did this danger appal her spirits that the first moment she found herself free from a white-gloved hand either at one window or the other she stopped the carriage and ordered the coachman to go far enough down the lane to permit her to get out unobserved by any persons passing by the road but poor mary was this day doomed to disappointment and the indignant and almost passionate beating of her heart under it made her more conscious perhaps than she had ever been before how deeply the business upon which she was engaged had entered into her soul soon after sir matthew dowling had dismissed his breakfast companion he strolled out towards his splendid stables and perceiving his son loitering among the grooms and himself equipped for the saddle he inquired whether he was going to ride only to ashley governor was the reply then wait five minutes augustus and i will ride with you whether the youth approved the proposal or not he was fain to submit to it and the evil star of mary brotherton contrived to bring them to the top of hoxley lane at the moment her carriage was about to turn into it stop cried the young lady accompanying the word with a very energetic pull at the check-string go on to ashley was the order that followed was ever anything so provoking nurse do you see who those hateful men are why tis sir matthew my dear replied the gentle old woman the wretch muttered mary between her teeth at the very moment that sir matthew on one side and his languishing son on the other besieged her carriage not for my right hand would i give him guess where i am going thought she as with a face suffused with the deepest carmine that agitation could produce she forced her lips into an unmeaning smile in return to their salutation the father and son came to exactly the same conclusion and at the same moment there was but one cause that it was possible to assign for her evident emotion she was deeply in love with augustus more deeply than even the young man himself had imagined the thing was plain no doubt remained no not a shadow of it on the mind of either father or son but it was the elder gentleman only who at once determined to push so fine a game to its close with as little delay as possible feeling quite sure that there was no liberty he could take at this moment which would not be welcome he made a sign to the coachman to stop and deliberately dismounting he threw his reins to his groom told miss brotherton's footman to open the carriage door and stepped in with the assumed air of a partially loved friend who knows that no leave need be asked mary shrunk back into her corner with considerably more disgust than if a reptile had possessed itself of the seat opposite this is not quite as it should be is it said sir matthew with a leer perhaps some other may have a better right here than i and a very expressive smile accompanied the words sir said miss brotherton come come my dear child you must not look vexed at any of my little jokes you know how we all dote upon you dear creature how beautiful that sweet blush makes you look he <laughs> he there goes poor augustus looking very much as if he could wring his papa's neck off but his turn we will hope may come by and by and now my dear i'll tell you what i am come here for we all want you and your good mrs tremlett too if she likes it to come over to us quite en famille to-morrow i don't know what love powder you have been scattering amongst us but there is not a single individual of the family who does not positively dote upon you tell me my pretty mary do you feel a little kindness for some of us in return an attempt to take her hand accompanied this speech 
and mrs tremlett who estimated pretty nearly her young lady's affection for sir matthew and his race actually trembled for the consequences but to her surprise mary answered after the pause of a minute oh dear sir matthew you are only laughing at me in a voice so exceedingly childish and silly that it might under similar circumstances have made the fortune of a comic actress and though she did not permit him to touch the hand he attempted to take she placed it together with its fellow so playfully behind her that sir matthew could only laugh and call her dear pretty creature meanwhile the carriage proceeded to penetrate through the dirty dismal streets which in that direction formed the suburb of ashley i must get out here said miss brotherton suddenly pulling the check-string here impossible my dear child nothing is impossible to me that i choose to do sir said the young lady springing to the ground the moment the door was opened the night was fain to follow the animated augustus threw himself from his horse at the same instant and mrs tremlett held herself suspended on the step of the carriage to learn what she was required to do i wish to know what is the matter with these miserable-looking children said mary approaching a half-open door at each side of which crouching on the stone step sat a pale and squalid-looking girl the eldest might be ten years old the youngest was certainly not more than six gracious heaven you are not going to speak to those creatures miss brotherton exclaimed sir matthew while his son instinctively backed his horse into the middle of the street and why not sir matthew said mary you are not aware of what you are doing i give you my honour you are not you have no conception what these sort of creatures are my dear dear miss brotherton get into your carriage get into your carriage i conjure you mary looked at him but said not a word in reply what ails you my little girl said she putting her hand upon the shoulder of the youngest child billy roller answered the little creature the billy roller smashed her said the eldest girl but was falling asleep against the machinery as lamed me are you mad miss brotherton exclaimed sir matthew surely mrs tremlett you ought to prevent your young lady from exposing herself to such scenes as these good morning sir matthew do not let me detain you said the heiress suddenly assuming the tone and style of a woman of fashion who chose to have her own way these sick little creatures quite interest me besides i must positively find out who billy roller is it is an instrument used in the works miss brotherton you know not to what you are exposing yourself fraud filth infection drunkenness i give you my sacred honour that i think you are very likely to be robbed and murdered if you approach the thresholds of such dwellings as these i beg your pardon sir matthew replied the heiress but you must excuse me if i obstinately persevere in judging for myself i know i am a spoiled child neither more nor less and as such you must either give me up or bear with me permit me to wish you good morning i shall do no more than approach the threshold of this dwelling i shall enter it having said this she waited no further parley but taking a ragged child in each hand set her little foot against the door which already stood ajar pushed it open and walked in her first idea on looking round her was that perhaps sir matthew was in the right filth she saw infection might lurk under it and who could tell if fraud and drunkenness might not enter the moment after to complete the group but there was little of selfishness and much of courage in the heart of mary brotherton so she presently forgot every notion of personal danger and was thus enabled to see things as they really were on one side of the small bare chamber and in some degree sheltered by the door which opened against it stood a rickety machine once intended for a bedstead two of the legs had given place to brickbats and instead of a bed the unsteady frame now supported only a thin layer of very dirty straw with the body of a dying female stretched upon it the only other article of furniture in the room was an old deal box without a cover but having a couple of planks each about three feet long laid across it serving either for table or chairs as occasion might require the walls the floor the ceiling and the remnant of a window were all alike begrimed with smoke and dirt it took not long to make this inventory and having completed it the young lady still holding in each hand a staring child turned towards the inhabitant of this miserable den and said are you ill my good woman the being she addressed raised her heavy eyes and in a voice so low as to be scarcely intelligible answered yes 
have you no assistance nobody to nurse you nobody but these pointing to the children has any doctor seen her demanded mary of the eldest child no ma'am replied the little girl and how long has she been ill ever since she'd come from the mill and how long is that a twelve month said the little one i don't know said the elder but my poor children you are not the only people that live with her i suppose have you got any father yes where is he at the mill have you got anybody else belonging to you said miss brotherton shuddering there's sophie and dick and grace replied the eldest child where are they all again inquired miss brotherton at the mill was again the answer are sophie and grace grown up sophie is answered the child and grace almost then why do they not stay at home one of them at least to take care of this poor woman cause they mustn't i tends mother you are not big enough to take care of her my poor child why don't you go to the factory and let one of the bigger ones stay at home they won't have me now cause of this and as she spake the child held up a little shrivelled right hand three fingers of which had a joint deficient i can't peace now and so they won't let me come and sophy won't let me go cause of this said the little one slipping her arm out of a bedgown which was the only garment she had and displaying the limbs swollen and discoloured from some violent contusion my poor little creature how did you do this said mary tenderly taking the little hand in hers and examining the frightful bruise twas the billy roller said the little girl in an accent that seemed to insinuate that the young lady was more than commonly dull of apprehension but how did it happen my child did some part of the machinery go over you no that was me cried the elder in a loud voice and again holding up her demolished fingers twas the stretcher's billy roller as smashed becky twas cause i was sleepy said the little one beginning to cry for she construed mary's puzzled look into an expression of displeasure they beats him dreadful ma'am said the sick woman evidently exerting herself beyond her strength she's a good little girl for work but they will fall asleep all of em at times when they be kept so dreadful long but these bruises could not be the effect of beating said mary again examining the arm it is quite impossible why ma'am the billy roller as they beats him with is a stick big enough to kill with and many and many is the baby that has been crippled by it there was something so hollow so sunken in the woman's voice that miss brotherton felt terrified the fact that a child of the size of the baby before her should have been beaten with such a weapon and with such violence seemed wholly incredible again she thought of sir matthew dowling's warning and wished that she were not alone i am afraid that you are very ill said she and i do not know how i can help you money i can give but there is nobody here to make use of it for you money murmured the sinking woman from her layer of straw money you can give money oh give it give it give it to her give it to the child she knows what it is she knows i am dying for the want of it it is too late for me but give it give it and may god here the miserable creature's strength wholly failed her eyes closed and to all appearance she was already a corpse oh this is very dreadful cried poor mary wringing her hands nurse will know better than me and so saying she turned eagerly towards the door she be gone mother and haven't given nothing said the eldest girl in a voice so mournfully expressive of disappointment that spite of her alarm mary stopped to take a half a crown from her purse which she put into the child's hand she looked at the coin and in a half whisper ejaculated oh then creeping to the bed she put it into the palm of her mother's hand pressing the fingers down upon it and in an accent of interrogation uttered the word bread this mary heard but not the answer to it for she had quitted the scene before it was uttered on opening the door of the house she started at seeing sir matthew dowling still within a dozen yards of it he was standing beside the carriage with one arm extended to keep the door of it open and the other resting against the vehicle on the opposite side of the opening while his head thrust forward within an inch of good mrs tremlett's nose effectually prevented her following her young lady however much she might have wished to do so 
he had indeed upon miss brotherton's disappearance receded the good woman almost by force and then addressed her in such a strain as was rapidly working her up to make an attempt to escape from the other side of the carriage when the reappearance of the young lady released her from her thraldom mrs tremlett he said are you aware of the awful responsibility which will rest upon you if anything unfortunate happens to your amiable but most headstrong young lady all the neighbourhood know mrs tremlett that she has as it were placed herself for protection in your hands refusing all other counsel and shutting her ears to all other advice and it is thus that you perform your duty good god sir what do you mean said the good woman in great agitation let me out if you please sir if my young lady is in any danger it is wicked to keep me sitting here let me out sir i will let you out mrs tremlett replied the knight still firmly retaining the position which so effectually kept her in i will let you out but first for her sake and your own it is my duty to tell you in a few words the sort of place she has now thought proper to enter don't struggle mrs tremlett but hear me it is not possible they can do her any personal injury as long as i am so near the door of the house as as present be very sure that from some hole or corner of the filthy premises some spying eyes are at this moment watching us there is no danger of her being murdered now but as sure as you sit there mrs tremlett murdered she will be if she goes without the protection of a powerful arm within such dens of sin and iniquity as she has entered now one short moment more mrs tremlett one short moment while i tell what the creatures are among whom she has thrown herself the house is notorious as one of the very worst in ashley the man is an habitual drunkard whom i and my excellent servant parsons have endeavoured in every possible way to reform but in vain the moment he has got his wages he goes to the gin-shop and often and often he won't work at all which of course prevents his family from being in the comfortable easy circumstances which they ought to be if he happens to be in the house now i dare say there is no species of indecent language to which your young lady will not be obliged to listen as to the mother of the family i believe she is dying in consequence of a life passed in all sorts of the most abominable wickedness indeed i believe she is now half mad for i have been told by some of my people whom i have sent upon charitable visits of inquiry to her that she lies in her bed inventing the strangest lies imaginable indeed some think that notwithstanding she is so near death she still drinks and that is nothing but drunken lies that she makes people listen to pray pray let me get out sir matthew being murdered sir is not the only thing from which i should wish to save miss brotherton one more word mrs tremlett and i have done the eldest girl is a notorious prostitute another a year or two younger is going the same way the boy is suspected of being an extremely skilful thief and the two younger girls for they all work at my factory mrs tremlett and i know them well the two younger ones are such depraved little wretches that for the sake of example we have been obliged to turn them out of the mill though we are in great want of young hands to do the work now madam i have done and i leave it with you to judge how far it will be right and proper for miss brotherton to continue such frolics as these sir matthew was in the act of pronouncing the last words of this speech as miss brotherton opened the door of the house and stepped out into the street on first perceiving her the knight appeared about to take her hand for the purpose of replacing her in the carriage but his attention was called to the sound of many feet suddenly turning the corner of a street which led from a neighbouring factory it proceeded from the workpeople who were rushing home in scrambling haste to snatch their miserable dinners gentlemen in sir matthew dowling's situation and enjoying the species of influence which belongs to it take little or no pains to avoid meeting the people they themselves employ they look not in the young eyes to read what sort of blessing cowers there nor heed the crippled gait or pallid visage of those who exist but by the poisonous employment which he gives them but such gentlemen seldom if they can avoid it expose themselves to the remarks of any gangs belonging to their neighbours and no sooner did sir matthew become aware that the mill in the next street was pouring forth its fifteen hundred hands than he turned from the young lady who had passed by without appearing to see him and taking his horse from the hand of the groom who held it sprung with great activity into the saddle and galloped off the way his indignant son had galloped before him 
mary brotherton meanwhile was utterly unconscious of the approaching throng and intent only upon getting mrs tremlett out of the carriage turned her eyes neither to the right nor the left but seizing her by the arm exclaimed come to me nurse come to me the good woman who was quite as desirous as herself of the reunion required no second summons but more quickly than it can be told was first by the side of her young mistress in the street and then entering with her the low door of the dwelling so fearfully described by sir matthew had mrs tremlett possessed the power most assuredly she would have turned the steps of her charge the other way and for ever have prevented her from exposing herself to the contemplation of such depravity as she had heard described but knowing perfectly well that no such power was vested in her the next wish she conceived was to give all the assistance and support she could to the dear wilful girl to whom she had devoted herself aware as she entered the door that many eyes followed them nay that many steps were stayed apparently to watch the spectacle so rare in ashley of well-dressed ladies entering the sordid dwelling of operatives mrs tremlett herself closed the door as soon as they had both passed through it and looking round upon the desolation of the chamber trembled with an emotion made up of terror and compassion at perceiving to what a scene the delicately nurtured mary brotherton had introduced herself this woman is very ill nurse tremlett said the young lady drawing her close to the bed for god's sake tell me what we had better do for her my dear dear miss mary come away and send the doctor to her answered mrs tremlett positively shaking from head to foot as she contemplated the ghastly countenance of the woman the filthy rag that imperfectly covered her and the scanty straw upon which her stiffening limbs were stretched this is no place for you miss brotherton come with me i say this moment and we will send the doctor and money and clothes too if you like it if i like it do you think i am amusing myself mrs tremlett feel her hand feel her pulse i believe she is dying these words though spoken very quietly and deliberately were uttered in a voice so unlike what she had ever heard from the young lady before that the old woman became dreadfully alarmed oh good god she is losing her senses were the words she uttered as she threw her arms round the person of miss brotherton and vainly attempted to remove her from the spot on which she stood fie upon you mrs tremlett said mary sternly do you fancy that you are doing me any good be satisfied that i am not losing my senses and let me request that you will make an effort to recover yours this woman's head is too low my dear mother asked for pillows here the steady voice faltered but it was only for a moment i want the cushions from the carriage nurse tremlett will you get them or shall i without answering a word the terrified old woman hastened to obey her and did so in the best manner for calling to the tall footman who continued to stand beside the open door of the carriage he obeyed the summons which he supposed to be preparatory to his young mistress making her exit by very unceremoniously thrusting right and left the curious group that still lingered on the threshold give me the cushions from the carriage jones she said make haste for god's sake the man stared at her for an instant in utter astonishment and then did as he was ordered now get upon the box and bid the coachman drive as fast as he can go to the nearest doctor's that's mr thomas i think in cannon street tell him miss brotherton has sent for him and desire him to get into the carriage directly having uttered these commands as rapidly as she could speak mrs tremlett carried a couple of the carriage cushions to the bed and with the assistance of mary and the elder child managed to raise the woman into a position apparently less distorted and painful than before have you anything to give her said mrs tremlett addressing the child the little girl without answering stepped to a sort of cupboard in the wall and taking thence a pitcher without a spout and a mug without a handle contrived to tilt up the former so as to make it discharge a portion of its contents into the latter it is water said mary watching the operation it will not hurt her will it nothing can hurt her my dear love replied mrs tremlett her eyes filling with tears as she listened to the altered voice of her gay-hearted girl whose smiles and frolics she had watched and indulged for so many years but of whose deep feelings she had never conceived any idea till now i don't think anything can hurt her now mary her pulse flutters and her forehead is quite damp i have sent for mr thomas and he will probably be here immediately mary's only answer was silently pressing the hand of her old friend as she took from it the broken mug of water and then 
kneeling on the sordid floor she applied it to the pale dry lips of the sufferer the poor woman made an effort to meet it and swallowed a mouthful eagerly and then relieved probably by the change of posture and refreshed by the cool liquid she stretched out the hand in which she still held mary's half-crown and said go betsy bye the child she addressed eagerly seized the money in the hand that had fingers to close upon it and flitted through the door in an instant the poor woman had again closed her eyes but her breathing was more tranquil and mary hoped she had fallen asleep with this persuasion she stood perfectly still and silent beside her her own hand locked though she was not conscious of it in the grasp of her deeply affected nurse while her whole soul seemed settled in her eyes as she fixed them immovably upon what she felt to be the most awful spectacle that a mortal can gaze upon namely the passing of a human spirit from life to death the little girl whose swollen and discoloured arm still remained uncovered probably because she feared the pain likely to attend the replacing it in the sleeve stood close beside her mother's head childishly contemplating the cushions which supported it and apparently as unconscious as they were of the heavy loss that threatened her but this stillness did not long remain uninterrupted all the members of the family who had been named as belonging to the factory except the father returned for the purpose of taking such rest and refreshment as one hour nearly half of which was consumed by the walk to and from the mill could permit the latch was lifted by the eldest girl a delicate featured but dreadfully dirty creature of about seventeen with a sort of sharp eagerness denoting the curiosity excited by the sight of the carriage stationed before their dwelling on perceiving the death-like countenance of her mother made distinctly visible by the noonday light that streamed through the open door she suddenly stopped clasping her hands together and uttering in tones that sounded like a shriek oh god she is dead no not dead said mary solemnly and without turning her eyes from the object on which they were riveted not dead she is sleeping hush do not disturb her close following on the heels of the first came a second girl about a year her junior but with a countenance much less prepossessing dirty she was too if possible more so than the others and there was a look of stolid stupidity about her that but for the sort of reckless audacity which lurked in her eye might have given the idea of an almost brutal want of animation a thin consumptive-looking lad of about fourteen followed after her and closed the door behind him as he entered oh mother he exclaimed as her sunken face caught his eye i wish i was alongside of ye and then we'd be buried together and without appearing conscious of the presence of the strangers he suddenly threw himself upon the tottering bedstead and nestling his face close to that of the dying woman kissed her passionately again and again my boy you may hasten her going by that said mrs tremlett gently be still be still all of ye but as she spoke she and mary too whose hand she continued to hold made way for the eldest girl who now eagerly but silently pressing forward dropped on her knees beside the bed and throwing her two arms over the emaciated body remained with streaming eyes that rested piteously on the face of her mother the second girl looked on till by degrees her heavy countenance appeared to stiffen into horror and she too drew near but with distended and tearless eyes that seemed to speak more of fear than love mrs tremlett looked anxiously into the face of her charge it was deadly pale and wore an expression of solemnity so new and strange that the good woman threw her arms around her in an agony of fond anxiety exclaiming my mary my dear dear child come away mary mary come away you can do no good this scene is not a fit one for you to witness you mistake nurse it is fit for me it is necessary for me do not disturb me nurse tremlett do not then after a short pause during which her eyes were closed and her hands crossed upon her breast she again whispered could she not pray with me shall i not ask her to pray with me my sweet girl she will not hear you i think said the old woman while the tears streamed down her cheeks but you shall be satisfied my darling and approaching the bed and leaning over the girl who knelt beside it mrs tremlett in a low but distinct voice pronounced the words shall we pray with you she was evidently heard and understood for the hands that for some minutes had lain motionless were with an effort brought together and clasped in the attitude of prayer 
mary who was eagerly watching her every movement suddenly stepped forward and gliding in between the eldest and the youngest girl dropped on her knees beside them mrs tremlett following close behind her knelt also and then with trembling lips and faltering voice but slowly distinctly and most reverentially mary brotherton uttered the last and most impressive of those sentences in our litany which is followed by the solemn petition for a deliverance it was with a throb of pleasure at her heart and an exclamation of thanksgiving from her tongue that she heard the dying woman answer amen almost at the very instant she did so the latch was again lifted and mr thomas one of the three medical practitioners of ashleigh entered miss brotherton was not conscious of ever having seen him before but he like every one else in the neighbourhood perfectly well knew the heiress by sight and now even now in the awful chamber of death bowed low before her it would not be easy to describe the feeling with which she turned away from this ill-timed demonstration of respect yet it was with no harshness for the struggle so often going on within us between our better and our worser natures was at this moment so decidedly in favour of all that was good in her young heart that there was hardly place for any severer feeling than pity within it she had risen from her knees as he made his bow and turning gravely towards him said if anything can be done sir for this poor woman let it not be delayed i fear she is very ill certainly ma'am certainly miss brotherton my best attention may be depended on but will you first my dear young lady give me leave to observe that i would much rather see you in your carriage than here i really cannot answer for it it is in point of fact impossible to say whether there may not be something deleterious something noxious in short to your very precious health in the atmosphere of this room i thank you sir be sure i will take quite sufficient care of myself but it is not for me that your services are wanted it is here sophy the eldest girl seemed unconscious of what was going on for she remained perfectly motionless on the spot where she had first knelt down while the third sister who had been sent on the poor mother's last errand for bread and who had crept back unobserved into the room during the foregoing scene occupied the space on her right hand mary brotherton having knelt on her left so that there was scarcely space for the approach of the smart apothecary move my dear girls said mary gently laying a hand on the shoulder of each they both rose while mr thomas carefully storing the anecdote and aid of the gossiping part of his practice looked and listened with astonishment to what seemed to him the very unnatural conduct of the rich young lady and internally exclaimed a clear case of religious mania this as i ever saw she won't live long probably what a match it required no very long examination of the poor patient to discover that her last moment was rapidly approaching upon my word miss brotherton i really wish i could persuade you to come away persisted the medical gentleman as he once more turned towards her the air is becoming more mephitic every instant this woman is at the last extremity nothing then can be done for her said mary no ma'am nothing in the world not the whole college if they were present could keep soul and body together for another hour i would venture to say on this miss brotherton put a fee into his hand and bent her head in token that his business there was ended and that he might depart but he did not immediately obey the hint for pocketing the unwanted golden prize he seemed anxious to remain a little longer where such blessings abounded and returning to the bed again took hold of the poor woman's hand and then said in a voice of authority let me have some water it was mary only who seemed to understand his words and she immediately obeyed them placing in his hand the broken mug which she had set aside upon the floor the apothecary put the water to the lips of the poor woman and she again swallowed a little of it after which they saw her lips move as if she were making an effort to speak to them mrs tremlett leant over her and then with a stronger effort she articulated let me see william who is william said mrs tremlett raising herself is it one of the children it be father said betsy where is he to be found cried miss brotherton eagerly let him be sought for instantly where is he likely to be at the gin-shop replied the ungracious grace if you know where he is go for him said mary impressively and for god's sake let him not delay the girl she addressed stared at her as upon something utterly incomprehensible but she obeyed 
and in so short a time as to show that the gin-shop was at no great distance returned with a man of an exterior as filthy as the rest of his race wretchedly crippled in the legs and a complexion that spoke both of ill-health and intemperance what it is come to that is it already said the man looking wistfully at her from the bottom of the bed but with a countenance whose lines seemed too fixed in the expression of hard indifference to permit its exhibiting much feeling she asked for you father said sophy gently then taking one of her mother's hands in hers she murmured mother dear mother open your eyes upon us father is here and all of us while large tear-drops fell upon the livid face as she hung over it the dying eyes were once more opened and consciousness and recognition of them all were visible as she suffered them to rest first on one and then on another the boy only from his position she could not see but even then there seemed intelligence between them and she certainly knew he was lying beside her for her head rested against his and she raised her left hand till her fingers touched his cheek the youngest child also when the mother's eyes opened was too much behind her but she seemed aware of her vicinity and pronounced the words little one probably her usual appellation so distinctly as to make the child start and instantly climb upon the bed to kiss her the last movement was an effort to return this kiss and the next moment mrs tremlett removed the child's clinging lips from a corpse a very awful interval of perfect stillness followed can i be of any further service to you miss brotherton from the lips of mr thomas were the first words that broke it poor mary only shook her head but mrs tremlett replied no thank you sir nothing more and with repeated bows and rather a reluctant step he departed turning however to give another glance at the heiress as he passed out for he was not without hopes that she might fall down in a fainting fit nothing however of the kind happened and he disappeared you will go now mary dear whispered mrs tremlett and i will come here to-morrow to inquire about them for you yes i will go now replied the young lady i cannot comfort them then looking round upon the steadfast group as if to discover which of them appeared in the fittest state to be spoken to she fixed upon the little betsy and placing a couple of sovereigns in her hand told her to take care of them and give them to her father presently adding tell your sister sophy to come up to my house this giving a card is the place where i live she then led the way to her carriage mrs tremlett followed and the next moment they were driving rapidly from the abode of the most abject misery to a residence which every quarter of the globe had contributed to render luxurious it was evident that the heiress felt no inclination to converse indeed for by far the greater portion of the way her face was concealed by the handkerchief which she held to her eyes and mrs tremlett had too much real feeling to disturb her after driving however through the handsome lodge gates and sweeping up the noble entrance of her mansion where already at the sound of her approaching carriage two or three servants were seen waiting like a guard of honour to receive her it seemed that her meditations had not been wholly confined to the death-bed scene she had witnessed and that the sordid cabin with its misery-stamped inhabitants had made a deep impression for the first and for many hours the only words she uttered after her return spoken to the ear of mrs tremlett as they walked arm in arm together through the hall were these i too am living by the profit of the factory house is the division just oh god is it holy the old woman felt that she trembled violently but she knew not what words to utter that might compose her on arriving at the foot of the stairs mary withdrew her arm and mounting them more rapidly than her companion could follow reached her bedchamber alone which she entered closing and bolting the door after her End of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording chapter thirteen disagreeable meditations a confidential interview with a faithful servant another interview not quite so confidential with the daughter martha and michael take a pleasant walk together to visit the widow armstrong a consultation it will be easily believed that sir matthew rode back to dowling lodge not in the very sweetest humour in the world bring up a child in the way he should go is an admirable proverb and certain it is that when that way is agreeable he does very rarely depart from the same 
thus it happens that the young gentlemen and ladies sons and daughters of the millocrats who pile thousands upon thousands and acres upon acres by the secret mysteries of their wonderful compound of human and divine machinery do rarely or never take their way into the dwellings that shelter and that hide the sufferings of their operatives nothing is so distasteful to a truly elegant mill-owner as any allusion domestic or foreign gossiping or professional religious or political to his factory or his factory people and the gay fatherly phrase don't talk of that for god's sake my dear it smells of the shop has turned away many innocent eyes from contemplating that which had they looked upon it could hardly have endured so long to know therefore that the wilful whimsical rich and independent mary brotherton while still too young to understand anything whatever of the real nature of trade and our glorious manufactures to know that she was beginning to thrust herself behind the scenes and do heaven knows what mischief among his devilish people instead of minding her own business and falling in love with his adorable son was altogether too much to be borne with patience and had it not been that the weather was so hot as to make him long for a draught of hawk and iced water a natural instinct would have made him turn aside from his park gates and pursue the by-path which led to his factory where as he knew by experience the sort of temper he was then in could find great relief without anybody but the overlookers being in the secret as it was however sir matthew dowling reached his home and the first thing he heard from the man who threw wide its portals was that mr parsons was waiting for him in his study bring me a biscuit a bottle of stein and some iced water said the knight in the accent of one not born to enter the venerable presence of hunger thirst and cold nor into that of heat or vexation either what's the matter now parsons said he throwing himself into a delicious armchair and perceiving by one glance at the sour visage before him that something or other had gone wrong the mill's not burned down i suppose is it and i'm not sure that would be the worst thing that could happen sir matthew if it was replied the confidential servant it is well insured you know sir and would bring in a famous sum as sure as the bank and that's more i take it than we can say of all our debts who the devil has been gossiping with you about the debts what business is that of yours i should like to know mind your billy rollers mr parsons and take care your hands keep up with your machinery that's your work and i can tell you if you don't know it already that the success of the concern depends more upon that than upon any other thing whatever the building is paid for and the glorious machinery is paid for mind that sir and where's the interest of it to come from if you let the hands go to sleep over it i tell you what mr parsons an overlooker is not worth his salt if he does not continually keep it in his head that the more the machinery is improved the faster must the brats move to follow it and you may rely upon it that where this is remembered early and late day hours and night hours the concern will answer and every manager of it master or man will live well but by the lord harry where it is not they are sure to go the wrong side of the post as you are to go to bed to-night it stands to reason parsons if one man knows how to drive and another doesn't the one man's team will pay and the others won't and i will be much obliged to any man who will tell me how i am to help being undersold in the market if i don't contrive to make my machinery go as fast and as long too as the best of em that's the business you are to attend to mr parsons and i won't trouble you about any other all true sir matthew every word of it and i can't but say though i scorn to be a boaster i can't but say that i think i have given you reason to trust me i am noted for being able to keep the children awake and going longer than any other man in the mill there isn't an overlooker in ashley that can equal me with the strap or the billy roller either when i chooses to make em tell i know all that my good fellow and i value your services accordingly but i have been devilishly put out this morning and that makes me snappish besides i am quite sure you have got something disagreeable to tell by your face so out with it man and make an end of it make an end of it sir matthew replied parsons repeating the last words of the sentence with marked emphasis by the lord sir that is exactly what i am come to beg you to do you must make an end of your charity job sir matthew for it don't answer in any way we have lost one of the nimblest set of fingers we had that wanted nothing but the strap to keep him going for sixteen hours out of the four-and-twenty and i wish you could just hear what gratitude you have gained in return for it 
there is not a single day comes round that the rickety little armstrong don't blubber over his work like a church spout and i overheard him the young villain when he didn't think i was so near i overheard him with the scavenger girl as was cleaning under the mules looked up and asked why for he cried when his brother had got such a good fortune i heard him answer and what do you think he said sir matthew how the devil should i know replied the chafed capitalist don't stand mumming there but out with it neither more nor less than this sir matthew don't talk of his good fortune bet says he he's the most unhappiest boy in all the world says he pestilent little vermin exclaimed sir matthew through his closed teeth infernal fool that i was to listen to that idiot woman and crockley too who ought to know better has been badgering me exactly with the same execrable nonsense never again as long as i live will i be persuaded to try any other scheme with the people than what we have always acted upon brutes and beasts they are and like brutes and beasts they should be treated and so they shall by me as long as my head's above ground well sir i can't but say i'm glad you are come back to your right mind as one may call it such romantical goings-on can never answer in a factory sir matthew it ain't the way to do business and business is what we have got to do and so sir i hope you will send that scamp mike back to the mill to-morrow morning for they can't say no worse of it let us pay him off as we will than that he's the most unhappiest boy in all the world and that's what they says already it won't do parsons that boy must be got rid of what do you stare for you ass do you think i am going to get hanged for him oh dear no sir matthew you know the value of your own life better than that anyhow god forbid you should not only i did not over well understand what you meant by getting rid of him i must contrive to send him out of the way at least out of this neighbourhood and moreover with his own consent and his mother's too that is what i meant mr parsons you must know best sir matthew but it seems to me you are taking a great deal of trouble about him if you'll just let me have him back in the mill i think i'll venture to say that he shall never get within reach of plaguing you any more and i'd get a pennyworth out of him into the bargain for a tolerably sharp fellow parsons you're devilish dull about this business can't you guess that i should not be taking all the trouble you talk of about such a beggar's brat as that unless i had reasons for it there's that lord's daughter that got me into the scrape won't she be ferreting and ferreting till she finds out that the sweet little master has not found himself comfortable here and ten times worse than her ay a hundredfold is that obstinate headstrong girl of old brotherton's my lady clarissa might be troublesome from mere folly and might perhaps be stopped short in any mischief she was doing by a few words from me but not the old one himself could stop mary brotherton if she got a whim in her head you should have seen her just now mr parsons raving at me with her colour up and her eyes flashing for all the world as if she had just escaped out of bedlam only because i cautioned her against going into joe drake's pigsty a pretty place wasn't it for a girl of her fortune to go visiting but in she went by heaven and you may rely upon it if such a girl as that who cares for nothing and to nobody once gets it into her head to go about among the factory people she'll kick up more than dust and we shall find it easy to lay again i've been told already by one who i suspect wanted to put me on my guard that this mary brotherton wished to have a little talk with michael armstrong i can put two and two together as well as miss mary she was at our cursed play last night and i'll bet my life to a rotten egg that she wants to ask him what he cried for likely enough sir replied the overlooker with a grim smile i heard of the crying i won't say that i didn't you may guess sir matthew that it was a good deal talked about among the servants and then t'other of em blubbering away at the mill must give a pretty notion mustn't it sir of your goodness to em say no more about it it makes me mad exclaimed the knight one or both of em shall be sent to deep valley mill parsons if i die for it there's none but prentices taken in at the mill in the deep hollow sir matthew if you mean that yes sir i do mean that replied sir matthew with a very ominous frown and there master michael armstrong shall go prentice or no prentice or i'll give him up my place and take his that's all then sir matthew 
said the overlooker preparing to depart i come to put you up to the boy's ingratitude and have nothing further to say at present you need not trouble yourself any more about that mr parsons i will take care of him replied the knight whereupon mr parsons made a bow and departed sir matthew dowling had already taken one tumbler of hock and water he now took a second and then throwing himself back in his armchair indulged for several minutes in very deep meditation at the end of that time it seemed as if the good rhine wine had done its office for suddenly the knight's countenance became animated the heavy gloom which had rested upon it disappeared and springing to his feet he rang the bell with a sort of lively jerk which showed he had some project in hand that he greatly relished it was the lively peggy who answered the summons but though she entered almost out of breath from the eagerness with which she had traversed the passage which led from the kitchen to the study and though she brought into immediate activity all the agacerie of which she was capable a smiling nod was all she got in return so eager did sir matthew appear to say go to miss martha peggy as fast as you can and tell her to come here to me this very minute go my dear and make haste there's a good girl peggy was disappointed and angry for she had a great deal to tell sir matthew about michael armstrong's ungratefulness and all that the servants thought and said about it but the command she had received was too peremptory to be trifled with and though she very nearly slammed the study door in shutting it she failed not to deliver her message which was instantly obeyed with the most dutiful alacrity by martha did you send peggy for me papa said she in entering yes martha i did how are you to-day my dear girl i have not seen you before this morning sit down love sit down i want to talk to you martha i have got something upon my mind that vexes me and i am going to open my heart to you about it oh my dear dear papa returned martha i should be so glad if i could be of any use to you you can martha you can be of great use and comfort to me in the first place you must be my father confessor and let me confess my faults to you and i hope you will give me absolution if you can for i really am very uncomfortable what can you mean papa why my dear i mean that i have been foolish enough to put myself in a great pet when i ought not to have done any such thing it is always wrong to let temper get the better of one but in this case it was particularly so you know the fuss that has been made about this little fellow that i have taken out of the factory i do assure you my dear girl that i really intended to be a very kind friend to him but i got so provoked at his crying upon the stage last night in that beautiful speech that was written for him that i cuffed him soundly for it when he came off and i am sadly afraid that i frightened the poor little fellow so violently that he will never feel comfortable and at ease with me again you cannot think how this vexes me oh my dear papa he will never remember it any more if you will please to forgive him and martha's heart bounded with joy as she spoke to think how completely miss brotherton's opinion would be changed could she but hear her father speak thus amiably of what had passed no martha no i cannot bear to see his frightened look and besides my dear i shall never be sure of myself you know how hasty i am i should live in perpetual terror lest anything should tempt me to give him a cuff there are other reasons too my dear martha which induce me to think that i should be doing the little fellow and his family infinitely more service if i apprenticed him to some good trade than he could ever gain by running about dowling lodge the excellent good sense of this observation struck martha as very valuable and she uttered the most cordial approbation of the wisdom and goodness from whence it proceeded i am exceedingly glad you agree with me my dear child proceeded sir matthew for i have an idea that you could be very useful in making the arrangement do you happen to know where the little boy's mother lives my dear martha no papa but michael could show me then you should have no objection to pay her a visit on this business my dear oh dear no i should like it so much very well my love then you shall set out immediately if you will or stay it would perhaps be better to get you the paper first that they will have to sign you must remember to tell them martha that i shall undertake to pay all the fees it certainly is an excellent thing for a poor family like armstrong's to have a boy apprenticed to a good trade 
i trust the mother will not refuse her consent from any selfish notion that she may lose the boy's help thereby it would be really very wicked you may tell her my dear that i shall continue to send her down nice and nourishing food and that little michael shall be taught to write and well instructed every way so she may be quite easy about him and he will be sure to send her a letter every now and then the knight concluded with a smile of kindness that perfectly enchanted his daughter oh my dear dear papa she said how few people there are who know you as well as i do let me go and look for michael now papa shall i i should like to go down to his mother with him at once and tell her of your great goodness the papers could be sent afterwards you know very well dear trot away then get your bonnet and parasol find your little squire and then come back here to me to receive my last instructions as soon as the happy-looking martha had left the room the bell was again rung and on this occasion answered by a footman the lively peggy choosing to turn herself another way as soon as she heard it is parsons gone demanded sir matthew of the servant no sir matthew he's in the servants hall was the reply desire him to step here directly though the overlooker was enjoying some very comfortable refreshment he promptly obeyed the summons and as soon as he had again entered the study and shut the door behind him his master said do you know parsons whether the woman armstrong can read yes sir i know she can and that's one reason why she is so outdacious about the workhouse and everything there's nothing on earth does so much mischief among the mill people as making scholars of em said the man i know that well enough who doesn't but you may go now i only wanted to ask you that one question replied the master once more alone the knight again took to meditation profound as was the state of ignorance respecting all things beyond their own wretched dwellings in which the operatives at that time were kept sir matthew had some misgivings as to the possibility that the name and fame of deep valley mill might have reached even hoxley lane if it had the sending to a woman who could read indentures by which her child should become bound to that establishment till the age of twenty-one was running a risk of more opposition than he wished to encounter but he had a ready wit and seldom remained long at a loss how to manage any business on which his mind had fixed itself when martha returned therefore he was quite ready with his last instructions have you found the little boy my dear said he mildly yes papa he is waiting for me in the hall foolish little fellow i believe he fears that you are very angry with him and he looks so much alarmed that i would not bring him in poor child but you were quite right my dear martha it is better not to harass him in any way now then martha what you have got to do is this explain to the poor woman that it is my wish to keep my promise of providing for her boy but that i am come to the persuasion that the apprenticing him to some respectable business will be better than letting him run about the place here learning nothing you may talk to the little boy you know he is a sharp child and i have no doubt will come to the same conclusion himself if you state the thing to him properly i have no doubt of it papa answered the innocent martha i will do my very best to make him understand it and what trade shall i tell mrs armstrong you have chosen for him stocking weaving my dear i really don't know a better and we may be able to help him if that he behaves well as he goes on well then papa now i may go yes my dear now you may go and you may just tell the woman martha that if she approves the plan i will call upon her myself some day with the papers a pleasant walk to you good-bye it was a very pleasant walk for martha was delighted with her companion she opened to him kindly and clearly the plan for his being put apprentice to a respectable trade and pointed out to his young but quick capacity the advantage this would give him in after life and the power he might hope to possess if he behaved well of providing for his mother and brother tis that what i should like best of all things said michael because please ma'am i know i must help em as they beant neither of em so strong as i be you are a good boy michael for thinking of them so much as you do that is the reason i take notice of you and love you the little fellow nestled closer to her side as they walked on and raising the hand that held his he laid it upon his shoulder and pressed his cheek upon it with very endearing fondness what an affectionate little heart it is thought martha and how very happy i shall be if i can help to get this business settled for him 
of course miss martha dowling had never been in hoxley lane before and notwithstanding her having so agreeable a companion she speedily became aware that the region was as unpleasant as it was new is this the only road my dear boy by which we can get to your mother's house said she almost mechanically enveloping her offended nose in her pocket-handkerchief it is here that we lives please ma'am said the child pulling her onwards how very foolish of me thought martha withdrawing her handkerchief of course poor people live in poor houses but i cannot think why the place should smell so number twelve was however soon reached and the young lady carefully led by her little attendant through the largest gap in the hedge to the outer door of the back kitchen in order that she might escape mrs sykes crowded front one go on first michael and tell your mother that i am coming said the considerate martha the child did so but in this case there was no means for preparation and having named the unexpected visitant and given his mother a hasty kiss he returned before martha had recovered the sort of shock which the dirty and desolate spot on which she stood had occasioned in truth no person unaccustomed to approach the dwellings of the operatives in the towns of the manufacturing districts can fail to be startled at the first near sight of them in the very poorest agricultural village the cottages which shelter its labourers have the pure untainted air of heaven to blow around their humble roofs but where forests of tall bare chimneys belching eternal clouds of smoke rear their unsightly shafts towards the sky in lieu of verdant air refreshing trees the black tint of the loathsome factory seems to rest upon every object near it the walls are black the fences are black the window-panes when there are any are all veiled in black no domestic animal that pertinaciously exists within their tainted purlieus but wears the same dark hue and perhaps there is no condition of human life so significantly surrounded by types of its own wretchedness as this martha dowling shuddered as she looked around her and when michael returned to lead her in she felt half afraid of crossing the gloomy threshold but the widow armstrong was as usual less dirty in her abject misery than perhaps any other inhabitant of hoxley lane or its immediate neighbourhood and the mild countenance and gentle voice with which she replied to the young lady's salutation removed all her scruples and she seated herself in the chair placed for her by michael with the best disposition in the world to improve the acquaintance i hope you are getting better mrs armstrong said martha in that tone of genuine female softness which is so impossible to mistake and that you don't miss little michael as much as you did at first you are very kind ma'am to take the trouble of coming to such a place as this replied the poor woman in a voice that indicated something like surprise upon which michael who had stationed himself near enough to enable him to slip his little hand in hers said with a tolerably expressive emphasis this is miss martha mother i wish ma'am i had strength and power to thank you as i ought for all your condescending kindness to my poor boy said the widow earnestly i never see him that he has not some fresh story to tell me of your goodness to him he can read a chapter in the bible now as well as any boy of his age need to do and oh miss this is all owing to you for never could he have given his time to it in the factory there is more praise due to him than to me mrs armstrong i assure you he is a very good boy at learning and minds every word that is said to him i suppose he has shown you his copy-book too hasn't he i never saw a child that had so good a notion of writing he was always a quick boy miss but never can he be thankful enough to you for teaching him how to put his quickness to profit it will be the making of him i am very glad to hear you speak so earnestly about his learning because that makes me think that you will be pleased at hearing the business i am come upon my papa who is very here poor martha stopped short she was going to add kind to little michael but her honest heart would not let her pronounce the words so she changed the phrase and went on with very desirous of being really useful to michael has commissioned me mrs armstrong to ask you if you do not think it would be more profitable and advantageous to him to be apprenticed to some good trade the stock weaving for instance than to run about our house any longer papa says he fears it will give him habits of idleness which he may be the worse for all his life and that would be quite contrary to his wishes which have always been that he should benefit all his life long by his good behaviour about the cow mrs armstrong's eyes which had been fixed on the countenance of martha every line of which spoke of truth and sincerity 
fell upon the work she held in her hand as these words were uttered and for a moment she made no answer but feeling perhaps that this was both ungrateful and ungracious to her visitor she looked up again and said i am sure ma'am we can never thank you enough for all your kindness there was the slightest emphasis in the world upon the word you but it was enough to heighten the colour of martha and for a moment she felt and looked displeased my power of myself to befriend your boy mrs armstrong is very little i assure you she said of course it is natural that i should take more notice of him than a person like my father can who has so many other things to attend to but it is to his generosity and benevolence that you must look for any lasting advantage you may hope to gain from him indeed ma'am i would be happy to take your advice in the disposal of him any way for i can't mistake your kindness or your power to judge what is best which of course must be greater than mine notwithstanding your young age and if michael likes it and you think it best ma'am martha saw that the mother's fear of having her boy parted from her was combating the wiser hope for his future advantage and fully conscious that the continuing his present mode of life could only be productive of mortification she boldly answered this appeal and in the confiding innocence of her heart ventured to say perhaps in this case girl as i am my judgment may be better than yours mrs armstrong i do not think it would be good or pleasant for michael in any way to continue living at the lodge as he does at present and i do think that if put to a respectable trade he may not only provide for himself but be a help and comfort to you and his brother likewise this is my opinion certainly and now ask his he is still younger than me to be sure poor little fellow and yet i think you ought to listen to his opinion well mike dear said the widow turning her head towards the child you hear what the young lady says speak up my dear and tell us what you think about it i be ready to go mother if she bids me and you like it replied the boy you can judge ma'am that he knows his duty that is just like him from the time he was able to speak dear creature it was always the same gentle good and reasonable i won't say but what the parting with him will be a sore trial to me but god forbid that i should set the wishes of my worn-out life against the hopes of his young one how far away is it miss do you happen to know where the master stocking weaver bides as he's to go to martha confessed her ignorance on this point but added that though she should be sorry to hear it was too far off for him occasionally to come home and pay her a visit she should be more sorry still were he to be placed in the town of ashley it would be only putting him for ever in the way of temptation mrs armstrong said she and i am sure you are too sensible a woman to wish that he should be where the doing his duty was likely to be a pain to him indeed and that i would said the poor woman earnestly tis the seeing their poor young faces for ever so sad and careworn that is the worst trial of all how true is what my dear father says about the factory people thought martha how wonderfully they do all hate work this conviction of their epidemic idleness however in no degree chilled the good girl's desire at once to perform her father's will and benefit a very interesting though not as she believed a very industrious mother and son so deeming it best to enter into no further discussion but to accept the consent uttered by both as final and conclusive she rose and smiling good-naturedly at michael said now you have taught me the way here i think i shall be able to get back again by myself and i dare say michael that you and your mother will like to have a little conversation together about this new plan for you but remember dear that you are home by five o'clock to read your lesson and show me your copy-book we were interrupted this morning you know then leaving in the poor widow's hand a welcome token of her visit and promising that she would either bring or send the papers necessary for her to sign before long the excellent martha dowling departed after having most innocently but most effectually lent her aid to the perpetration of as hateful a crime as the black heart of long-hardened depravity could devise having waited till the figure of the young lady had passed across the little window the widow armstrong pulled her boy towards her and gave him a mother's kiss to be sure thee dost look all the better my mike for good food and fine clothing but i shan't be satisfied unless you tell me that you like all these new favours that they are going to confer upon you i like to go mother very much replied michael stoutly thank god then my darling you are provided for she rejoined with a deep sigh 
i have known a many stocking weavers mike exceedingly well to do and there was never one of them i'll answer for it that had a better will to work and to do his duty than you have so i have no right to doubt but what you will do well and i don't doubt it but tis the parting with thee my dear dear child oh mike you have been a comfort to me ever since you was born and how do i know if mother cried the boy interrupting her i'll be a comfort to you still i'll tell you what i've got in my head to do and just see if it is not a good plan i mean to be the very best boy that ever my master had and when i've gone on working with him a bit two or three months perhaps mother time enough for him really to find out that i am a good boy i will tell him all about you and teddy and make him understand that if he wants to keep me in good heart to work he must let me trudge away home to pass a sunday now and then with you two i don't think he'll be able to say no mother when i tell him about teddy's poor legs and all you have done for us both lying abed here mrs armstrong again kissed her boy and after gazing at him with a look in which pride and pleasure were strangely blended with anguish she said i do think you'll make your way michael for you are a good boy a very good boy but i don't know how poor edward will take it that's the worst part of it mother replied the little fellow beginning to cry poor teddy does look so very happy of a night when he sees me pop round the corner upon him as he comes out of the factory but then i shall be able to help him mother all the better by and by and when i come home of a sunday mother i must teach him to write and then think how beautiful to have a letter from one another i know who'll give me a slate for teddy and me too to learn with and that's miss martha and i shan't mind asking her not the least because she knows i am going away and do you know mother i've got another notion and that's no bad comfort neither i should not a bit wonder if miss martha was to turn out a right good friend to you and teddy when i am gone and so the little fellow ran on each hopeful word he uttered begetting a new hope till by the time the hour of departure arrived his poor mother had at least the comfort of believing that the prospect opening before him was one that he looked upon with much less of pain than pleasure meanwhile martha found her way safely home and gave her father such an account of the result of her mission as induced him to give her a kiss and declare that if she was not the handsomest of the family she was out and out the most useful End of chapter thirteen